top headlines for the week ending April 28. Anil Nanlal arrested and released on his own recognizance. Bagot stung man stabbed to death. Fire leaves Burby's family of five homeless. PPP says they will never allow sugar to fall once in government. Sugar workers allegedly barred from protesting. Extreme poverty and marginalization rampant in the Caribbean and Latin America. Welcome to MTV News Updates Week in Review for the week ending April 28th. I am Trisha Ramlal. Good afternoon. Former Attorney General Anil Nanlal, who is accused of stealing a quantity of law books allegedly belonging to the state, has categorically affirmed that he will not be returning the books as they are his property and not the state's. Former Attorney General Anil Nandalal on April 24, 2017, was called in for questioning by ranks of the Special Organized Crime Unit on the grounds of alleged unlawful acquisition of law books, which he obtained during his tenure. Nandalal says the books were given to him as part of his condition of his services to the state and he would not be returning them. I, 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 I am not going to repay for what? The government paid my phone bills while I was a minister. The government paid my internet bill while I was a minister. They paid for my driver. Am I going to refund all of those? They were all conditions of my service. There was nothing different about this. Mm. So the issue of repayment does not arise. According to him, he was informed by ranks about the alleged unlawful acquisition of law books earlier this morning, where he then headed to Soku and gave a statement. Describing the matter as another act of witch hunting, he says the government is unaware of the mandate following his questioning. What I said to the Soku officers today, I said it, the, the, my two cell phones are more valuable than those books now. Mm -hmm. At the time they carried a particular price, but because now they have become outdated, I can buy those 14 books for 2,000 US dollars, as the leader of the opposition has said. I said if the government is so desperate, and perhaps Williams will f eventually read <laughs> something, yeah. I can donate 14 books to the state. I can afford that. Noting that the matter is an untimely one, General Secretary of the party, Mara Jaglio, says the matter, which is presently two years old, has already been in the public domain. Jaglio also questions why this particular matter was given urgency out of the 300 plus cases which were mandated to be investigated by Soku. But we are not going to lie down and roll over on when they pursue this vindictive vendetta against our members. And so we stand fully with Anil Landalal on this. We, we know he is not going to be intimidated by this Attorney General. The General Secretary believes such acts are driven to intimidate the PPP in an effort to halt exposure of the government. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Meanwhile, on Thursday, April 27, Anil Nanlal was arrested and charged by officers attached to a special organized crime unit. However, he was released on his own recognizance after being placed before the court. He is to return to court on May 10. Details in this report. Former Attorney General Anel Nanlal was arrested by the Special Organized Crime Unit. Nanlal was arrested at his office on South Road by officers attached to Soku just before noon today, after he was questioned again to hand over the law books, which are in his possession. Nanlal refused to comply, as such he was charged by Soku for holding onto the property of the government. Nanlal was subsequently transported to the Georgia Magistrates Court to be placed before a magistrate for the offense committed. However, when Nanlal's attorneys made representation, they were told that the matter cannot be heard before any magistrate today. I am personally aware that matters are filed in the, in the afternoon and heard in the, in the afternoon once they are sitting magistrates. A few days ago, a young man was charged for causing death by dangerous driving on the Lethem Trail, a matter that was about two years old, just like this one is. 
That matter was filed in the afternoon and it was heard in the afternoon and bail was granted. The fact that there are sitting magistrates available now and nobody wants to hear the matter looks very, very strange and very bad. Nanlal was then transported back to Soku headquarters for that offence to be amended. When he was brought back to the court, the matter was then heard before Magistrate Fabio Azor, who read the charge that in May 2015, he collected the law books from the Ministry of Legal Affairs to be used for his own purpose. However, Attorney Glenn Hanneman argued that the matter is before the High Court as an order of stay is granted to Nanlal from Soku collecting the law books. The attorney further argued that until the High Court makes a ruling, the magistrate court cannot charge his client. Nanlal was subsequently released on his own recognizance. Outside the courtroom, Nanlal maintained that the books are his property and that cannot change. When I took this job, I took it at a loss of income, that I was earning much more. And part of the package which I negotiated was the payment of my subscription for the law books. The state cannot produce any document that they ever purchased law books. The state paid my phone bills, the state paid my light bills, and the state paid my subscription fees. The state can't claim my cell phone because they paid my phone bills. They can't claim my electrical appliances because they paid my light bills. Similarly, they can't claim the law books. They have no relationship with the supplier of that law book. The I was being supplied those books under a contract that predated my appointment by a decade. And that contract still continues. It is between myself and the publishers of those books. All that the state did was to pick up the subscriptions, as the state has done in relation to many, many publications throughout the government structure. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Extreme poverty and marginalization continue to plague Latin America and the Caribbean. This is according to the Human Development Report 2016. The report calls for greater attention to empower the most marginalized society and recognizing the importance of giving them a greater voice in decision-making processes. As such, a strong focus on dismantling key barriers to development is urgently needed to ensure sustainable human development for all. The report finds one in three people worldwide continue to live in low levels of human development as measured by the Human Development Index. Program Specialist UNDP Patrick Chesney says in 2009, some 59 persons have been living in poverty. These are indices and therefore there are a number of uh, components um, data that have been um, included in the computation of, of these indices and it's important to understand that when decompose it gives you an idea of where more work needs to be done in terms of um, Guyana being able to achieve high human development. Worldwide, while indigenous people represent 5% of the world's population, they account for 15% of the world's poor. The report notes that women have also been traditionally disadvantaged because they assume the majority of unpaid care work. To this end, women hold only 28% of seats in parliament in the region, while 37% of legislators and senior officials are female. Expressing disappointment, Minister of Finance Winston Jordan says there is need for the presence of more youths at the launch of such a report. He believes their exclusion is a form of injustice. According to him, the government is challenged frequently to meet regional and national partners. Importantly, we need to measure whether or not we are achieving those intended results based on evidence. And that evidence must be supported by robust data and the analytical findings that data-rich systems provide. It is only along this path can informed policy formulation and decision-making take place. With Guyana being ranked 127 on the list of human development, Jordan says there should be more use of comparable dimensions to chart the results for the report. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The People's Progressive Party, who has been championing the sustenance of the sugar industry, claims that no estate would have been dissolved with the party in governance as they had promised in their manifesto to pump billions of dollars into the sector. The People's Progressive Party is maintaining there is need for justification following the closure of some two sugar factories.
This is according to executive member of the party, Dr. Roger Lunchen. Dr. Lunchen says the party did not submit any recommendations to the administration as his party thought the government would have handled it successfully. It is no secret that the People's Progressive Party has insisted not only is sugar industry salvageable, but it must be salvaged. According to him, the People's Progressive Party would have never pushed the sugar industry to a state which it is presently in under the coalition. Additionally, his party has promised in their manifesto would have pumped billions of dollars into the industry as needed. We have pointed out how easy it is in the manifesto of the PPP in 2015, we dedicated, we said, once we were returned to office, $20 billion would be allocated to the sugar industry. The PPP is contending that sugar is important as they believe factors necessary to save the industry are doable. A draft white paper on the sugar industry will be laid in the National Assembly on May 8, 2017, which would see a debate between the government and the opposition party. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. When sugar workers came out in their numbers on Tuesday, April 25 at Enterprise to protest against the closure of estates, they were allegedly barred from doing so by the Guyana Police Force. The Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union, who has made a claim, believes such denial does not augur well in a democratic society. The march which was supposed to take place at Enterprise non Pearl, East Coast Demorara, was aborted as the Guyana Police Force refused to grant permission the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union said the aborted march was organized by GAU to call attention to the sad situation that would face workers should the government move forward with plans of closure to sugar estates. According to the union, the large number of workers who gathered at the location was paved with the alleged decision of the Guyana police force. They believe the refusal is tantamount to the denial of workers' constitutional right and an affront to freedom of expression. Our union, while being respectful of the laws of the land, at the same time wishes to register, register its strongest condemnation at the refusal which, in effect, is not in keeping with the established trade union rights and serve to deny citizens their right of peaceful protest and assembly. Describing the Arab denial as a bitter one, President of Gawu Kobal Chan says the matter does not hold good for democratic development for the country. Additionally, he says an attempt to seek an explanation from the force proved futile. And uh, yesterday's event doesn't hold good for our um, for the what we consider um, the situation with the democratic situation in our country, the democratic development that we have got over the years. It doesn't look good, and. Uh, we, we, don't, we are not too certain if it's a one-off decision by the police or whether this will be the norm. The union is hopeful the actions displayed by the force would not be repeated. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The exchange rate for the U.S. dollar has remained under 218 Guyana dollars following checks with several commercial banks. Details in this report. At a recent meeting with the Private Sector Commission, Governor of the Bank Dr. Gobin Ganga assured the Commission that there is an adequate supply of foreign exchange and provided statistical evidence to support this position. Dr. Ganga had explained that the Guyana dollar should remain relatively stable due to the current low price of imports of petroleum and petroleum products which more than offset the decline in export receipts. Meantime, the current exchange rate for the US dollar at the commercial banks seems relatively stable when this newscast checked. At the Guyana Bank for Trade and Industry GBTI for the US dollar, the bank is buying at $207 and selling at $210, while wire transfers stands at $216. Republic Bank Guyana Limited is buying a US dollar for $207 while they are selling for $210 
with wire transfers at $210. Over at Scotiabank, they are buying at $211 while selling at $214. However, for wire transfers, they are buying at $213 and selling at $216. Meantime, at Demerara Bank, they are buying at $204 and selling at $210, while Citizens Bank is buying at $203 and selling at $210. In the first quarter of the year, the commercial banks had indicated that the U.S. dollar was fluctuating between $210 and $230. However, Central Bank has made several interventions to stabilize the situation. The Central Bank Governor had also opined that one should not pay more than 215 Ghana dollars to 218 Ghana dollars for a US dollar, but conceded that there is currently a relatively short waiting period for persons who wish to purchase foreign currency. The governor pointed out that even with all this speculation in the market, the depreciation of the Ghana dollar was modest. He also cautioned that demand should be screened to establish the legitimacy of the requests. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. An Albaistan businessman will be taking legal action against the police in A Division after he sustained a broken ankle and is claiming that officers are responsible for the injury sustained. Details in this report. Businessman Sion Gross, also known as Odell, during an interview with News Update says he was in his house when a van load of policemen came to arrest his cousin for an alleged felony. Gross explained that he decided to venture outside to see what was taking place after a crowd began to converge at his shop. The man further explained that because he was the eldest of the family, he went to represent his cousin's interest. Some guys with gentlemen were sitting there, the youngsters, picked them up and every, they only go to he, they wanted the station. I got a brother live upstairs. He come out and asked, what's the reason for you coming in the station? They didn't reply. Well, I was, I just get fresh bread from the baker shop. So I was eating. So I didn't pay much mind of it. And in the height of it, I said to myself, let me go outside as the big cousin and see what's really taking place. Because a crowd of people come out here and it's a commotion. Officer, you all know me. Where's the, where's the issue with this youngster? I see big cousin. We needed to the station for no none of the officers have response to my question. Rose explained that after he cooperated with the officers, he along with his cousin joined the police vehicle with the intention to visit the Brigdam station. That was however short lived after he claimed that the officers stopped the vehicle and allegedly threw him out. But when I get up, I try to get on my left feet and I had no balance. A gentleman who, unfortunately, was one of my tenants, he aid, he come to my aid. He said, oh, don't stand on your left feet. It looked like it already broke. But when I tried to get on my right foot to get some, from, some leverage, I realized I couldn't stand up on that foot either. See, he had to actually drag me from Independent Boulevard and King Ed, I would say King Edward, and yeah, this King Edward Street, cast not shortly through this street, and bring me in and, and put me here. And I said, I just her, I said, yeah, close up the shop. This looked like the police just showed me out of the vehicle. She said, what? Well, I said, yeah, the just seeing. And we go to the hospital and find out I got a broken right toe and a broken ankle. The man said that on April 23, he had to remove the cast which was on his left foot because it began to swell. I mean, this is not a drug shop. We don't sell tobacco leaf. We don't sell marijuana. You know, everybody got one thing where you are by stung. We are one thing. Well, guess what? It's a different Rasta thing. You know, I do a legal business. I have a police officer in my yard as a tenant for the last eight to nine years. She will, she will verify that what I do here. You know, I have big children born in the United States of America. My mistakes happen away from this country so i've learned from that so i haven't given the opportunity to come home pick up my mother property try to do the right thing here comes here comes this meantime divisional commander clifton hicken says the police are investigating the matter 
Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. A Barbie's family of five on Saturday, April 22, lost their house due to a fire of unknown origin. The fire would start it when two children were home alone, totally destroyed the five-bedroom house. A 28-year-old woman, her 57-year-old husband and their three children are left pondering their next move as a fire of unknown origin gutted their Miss Phoebe Portmoron quarantine Burby's home. According to the mother of three, Mohani Ramdat, she left for market with her 8-year-old son around the six hours of that morning when her husband, who is a handyman, left for work. Her two other children, ages 5 and 3, were left at home unattended. It was when the physically shaken woman returned home around 7 hours 30, she noticed that fire had engulfed the upper flat of her home. She immediately raised an alarm and several persons formed a bucket brigade but were unable to extinguish the fire. The children were already out of the house. Firefighters from Rosal Fire Station arrived on scene shortly after but were unable to save the building. The family is now pleading for assistance from the public to turn a new leaf. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. A man who would do odd jobs within the community of Bagotstang was allegedly stabbed to death when he went to draw water from a tap in Water Street on Tuesday, April 25. Details in this report. Dead is 43-year-old Mark Eiffel of Bagotstang East Bank Damarara, who was allegedly stabbed to death by a known individual who lives in the same area. According to the aunt of the deceased, Brenda Eiffel, she received a call that her nephew was stabbed during a confrontation. Somebody called me and told me that I must come right now. A man by the name of Muslim stabbed Mark. And when I come, I met him lie down on the road, covered in blood. An eyewitness explained to News Update that it is normal for Mark to go into the yard to get water from the tap. The eyewitness further explained that this morning was no different except that the alleged suspect chased Mark out of the yard. According to the eyewitness, the suspect who lives at the back of the yard with his family came out and began to fight with the now dead man. Yeah, Muslim lash in the face with the gun. So after Muslim lash she and the gun, you see the gun, the socket from the gun fall out and it was empty. So Yankee started to cough, they start boxing hand to hand. The boxing go on for like a 10 to 15 minutes and then it stopped. Because after the fall, long, the John parred them and said, yeah, take a break. After John said, take a break, Muslim ended up walking in here because the whole back Yankee there, he couldn't get to go to Yankee. So the whole back Yankee there, he go in front of the yard. Inspector wife come out and hold Muslim and tell Muslim go inside. And you can get family, your wife and your family for live for. He's still insisting, insisting to be outside, be outside. So they had exchange of wars with Rusty Gun and you box no Rusty, effing Rusty Gun and all them thing. The eyewitness claims that Mark was defending himself with a piece of wood when the alleged suspect utilized a knife he had in his hand. He ended up taking the man lash and the man raised his hand, so he ended up getting a joke the man by his heart. So the man, holy heart, and dropped the wood and said, Oh God, yeah, I call the ambulance. All I went is when I run and go to here and I tell my grandma to bring out shit and stuff to tie you off from bleeding. They are tie you off because your blood pouring out. After we tie you off, he went to the item, nobody want to help you. We call the ambulance. The ambulance take over half an hour for come and the man ended up dead when the ambulance reached. Mark's body was subsequently removed by undertakers from the scene. The alleged suspect, who was apprehended by police officers, is assisting with the investigation. The knife suspected to be the murder weapon was also recovered by the police. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Following the speculation surrounding the disappearance of Seanette Savory, the mother of one of the suspects is refuting claims of any involvement in the disappearance of Savory. Patrick Bannister called Fato is one of the suspects the police are hunting for for questioning about the disappearance of Seanette Savory. The mother of Bannister, Radhika Kisun, who came forward to clear her name, claims she has no contact with her son. The 60-year-old mother denies ever knowing Seanette Savory or having knowledge of her son's involvement with the missing woman. And when I go by Evil Larry, the question man asked me where my son is, I said, I don't know where he is. I can't know because he come and bury the father. 
me and he joined Bernie Farah. He left. He said, Mommy, how are we going home? And up to now, up to now, I ain't see. Confirming that her son went to prison some 20 years ago, Kisun says she's unsure whether he might have been involved in Savory's disappearance. Kisun said she does not want to hear from her son as she's trying to stay far from the police. I don't know say nothing about them kind of problems. I want them to take me out of this problem, baby. Because I don't know nothing about, nothing about this problem. Savory went missing on August 28, 2016, after she reportedly left her apartment to carry out an errand. Her relatives only learned of her disappearance after Savory's landlord contacted the family to inform them she had not seen her in days. Meanwhile, a wanted bulletin had been issued for the two suspects, Patrick Bannister called Fatu and Ritisha Rahman called Tesha, for questioning in relation to Savory's disappearance. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Government Analyst Food and Drug Department is rubbishing claims that the newly implemented Caribbean registration system will see a massive increase in the cost of medicines and supply in the public health system. This comes against the backdrop of former Minister of Public Health, Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, claiming there will be increases in the cost of medicines and supplies. He claims the government will have to spend more on medicines, but will in turn receive less, leading to drug shortages in the public health system. As such, he urged the coalition to review the change in policy, as he believes requiring imported medicines registered in Canada, United Kingdom and America is a regressive move to stack the deck in favour of one supplier. On the other hand, Director of the Government Analyst Food and Drug Department, Marlon Cole, has refuted the claims that prices for medical supplies will skyrocket. It, is, it would be inaccurate to say that you're banning drugs from India because a lot of the drugs manufacture, manufacturing sites in India are manufactured on behalf of companies in, in, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and in the UK, and there are sites that have been pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. So that would be inaccurate to state. Suppliers were informed that the department will only register medicines for entry into Guyana, which are already registered in the ABC countries and Australia. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The Minister of State is quoted in the media as saying that the regularization of hemp is not the government's priority at this time. However, this infuriates the Guyana Hemp Association, who has been restlessly calling for the legalization of the industrial plant. Here is what the association had to say. The Guyana Hemp Association is still calling for the review of the narcotic legislation, which places hemp in that category. Recently, Media reports claim that the Minister of State, Joseph Harmon, allegedly said the regularization, the cultivation of hemp in Guyana is not government's priority at this point in time. However, this angered the Guyana Hemp Association, who in response bombarded the minister for his alleged statement. Executive member for Guyana Hemp Association, Lyndon Jamat, said Guyanese import billions of dollars in narcotic-based drugs from other countries while Guyana can produce these plants to improve the economy and the livelihood of citizens. The establishment of this monopoly that we have been dominated by from since slavery time, even up to this time it has been transforming itself and coming in different forms. Now imagine we in Guyana, we have to import hundreds of millions of dollars in narcotic-based drugs from the UK and from Europe and these kind of places. And we can produce those things here and develop our country. There are many other products that we can produce, find employment for all the youths in the country. We can remove poverty and so. Co-chairman of the association, Michael Curtin, called on the government to view hemp as a single crop to catapult Guyana's economy, which will also eradicate poverty. Mr. Harmon's statement that the government is not in a hurry to regularize hemp I think Mr. Harmon needs to look at the United Nations 1961 Narcotic Act, which removed hemp as a narcotic. And two, he needs to check with the clerk of parliament to see that last year we presented a petition to parliament signed by thousands of people from all parts of Guyana requesting parliament to look at the laws. It has not been laid, it has not been debated, and we are calling the government to quickly get it laid and debated. 
The Ghana Hemp Association is calling on the government to legalize the cultivation of hemp in Ghana due to the economic gain the country can benefit from. The Linden Hemp Association has already attracted an Australian firm to establish a factory and market the products once the government assents to its cultivation. Hemp, though a member of the cannabis family, has little TCH, the ingredient that causes hallucination from the use of marijuana. Products such as rope, clothing, building material, food for animal, and oil are derived from hemp. This is Yanis Abrams for News Update. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Tuesday, May 2 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I am Trisha Ramla, thanking you for watching.